Well, my name is Dan Olson. I'm an attorney over at Bastard Remedy in Minneapolis, just a couple blocks away. And I'm going to present today with David Soule, who's a partner at Knocker to Grinnell, also in Minneapolis. And we are obviously here to talk about free print. So congratulations for being two of the 25 or however many attendees there are this morning that have exhibited the best decision making thus far. It sounds like there'll be a prize. Um, I think the prize is going to be lunch. Yeah, you get not. a free lunch, I think, for, oh. for choosing this, this session. Yeah. So it might not be the greatest prize. Um, but so what we're gonna what we're gonna talk about, we're gonna briefly discuss um, you know an overall writing plan and, and some of the things that you should you should uh, consider. Oh, it looks like we're gonna get a third. Um, so we're gonna start talking about the writing plan, what you should consider before you actually start writing. Uh, then we're gonna talk about Brief format and what the best way to do. Yeah, we figured that there, there must be another way in. You found it. Yes. We'll come on in. Um, so I, as we were saying, we were just talking very briefly about the about the outline and what we're going to talk about. And I guess first and foremost, it says there's just four of us and two presenters. If you have a question, please jump in. We had designed this initially to be more of an open discussion rather than a presentation. And that reality rings even truer now that we're such a small intimate group. So at any point, if you have a question um, or want to chime in with your own thought about what we're saying, please please feel free to do so. Can I jump the gun? Yeah. So we did do brief writing probably in lawyering or research classes. How did you guys learn? Did you actually learn once you got to your firm how to write a brief, or did you kind of have the nuts and bolts down while you were in law school? For me, uh, probably a little bit of both. You know, I thought I knew. Uh, when I was on with law school, how to write a brief. Uh, I participated in the moot court at the University of Minnesota, uh, so I got chances to, to do a lot of brief writing there. Uh, and then uh, I clerked with uh, the Minnesota Center for Environmental Advocacy, a uh, nonprofit environmental group, and had a chance to do legal writing there. And you know, I thought at the time that I had a pretty good grasp on how to write a brief and, and make it persuasive and effective. But really, uh, learning how to write well takes a lot more practice and experience than you get in law school. Uh, so a lot of it came through trial and error and mentorship uh, at my firm uh, with, with partners giving me advice on how to be an effective writer. And I, I clerked after law school. So I clerked for one year at the district court level and then two years at the um, state appellate court. So I wrote constantly. That was basically you know, all I did you start at a firm, uh, you know, you, you get a lot of experience because you're generally, at, as an associate at, at least on many cases, you're the ones that are working up a brief, um, you know, initially before the partner gets it and the partner uh, you know, rewrites it, <laughs> yeah. makes, makes the correct edits, I guess it is how I would, how I would say it normally happens. Uh, but, you know, the most important thing to, to know, especially if you want to become it's, it's a process and it's and it and it never stops. I mean, there's some of the best attorneys uh, at my firm still attend uh, CLEs about brief writing, even though they present CLEs on brief writing. So um, there's not one class you can take. There's not one point in your career when it'll all suddenly click. It's kind of like an ev evolution that will start, you know, from law school and continue all the way. Uh, so back to our outline here, we're going to talk about uh, the writing plan, and for those of you that joined late, we're going to begin by discussing you know, some of the strategy you need to develop before you sit down and put pen to paper or finger to keyboard, as it would be these days. We're then going to transition into brief format and talk about you know, some of the nuts and bolts of what makes a brief effective, and then we'll finish off discussing some general writing tips. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dave, who's going to uh, start us off with the writing plan. So before you start uh, hammering away on the keyboard, uh, there's steps you need to take to get ready to get to that point. Probably the most important thing, uh, at least in my view, uh, and everyone has a different view on brief writing, uh, is you need to know your law and know your facts uh, before you sit down. And you know, probably the, the biggest, most substantial briefs that you're going to write, uh, unless you're doing appellate work, are going to be uh, briefs supporting or opposing motions for summary judgment. Those are the pivotal, pivotal 
briefs in, in any civil litigation. Uh, so I'm always going to kind of have that frame of reference. Uh, so when you're getting ready to write your motion for summary judgment or your brief supporting that motion, uh, the most important thing first off is to know the facts of the case and know them inside and out. In all likelihood, you will have been working on the case uh, for some period of time, so you will have seen all the documents that are produced. You will probably, in your early career, you will have been the person who looked at all those documents, uh, getting blurry eyes staring at a computer screen for eight hours a day, uh, figuring out which emails are relevant, which ones can be used to build the case, sorting them out. Uh, you're, you will have uh, helped the partner that you're working with prepare for the depositions. You may have attended the depositions. You certainly will have read the transcripts from the depositions. Uh, you will have looked at the documents that you've given over. Uh, you will know the facts. But make sure before you start writing that brief that you go back and you review them. Because the facts really are what make and break a case. I mean, the law is what the law is. Uh, the facts, I guess the facts are what they are. Uh, but you need to know about them. You need to know the good facts for your case and the bad facts for your case. You also need to know the law that's relevant. So spend a lot of time researching and really digging in uh, to make sure that you know the good law for you, the bad law for you, how you can distinguish those cases, how you can make your case uh, look more like the one that's right on point that, that will cause the court to rule in your favor. Because if you have that knowledge of the law and facts in mind, it's going to make it a lot easier for you to build your brief. The worst mistake you can make, at least in my view, is you set out writing your brief with your recollection of what a witness said in the deposition. And you, you build your argument based on what you think that they said. And then when it's time to go back and actually find that part of the transcript of the deposition, it's not there. Because you remember them saying something more powerful than what they actually said and, and what they said was more equivocal. And suddenly you've spent three days writing a brief premised on this admission that you thought the witness made. But when you look at the transcript, you realize that's not exactly what they said. So you have to go back, undo all that work. You can do the same thing with the law. Uh, you can say, well, when I first looked into this, my conclusion was uh, that uh, you can establish a breach of contract by showing this element. And you build your whole argument around, well, they, we are showing a breach because we know this fact is true. And then when you're writing the brief and you, you go back and you look for the site, you know, you've, you've written the whole brief and you just left a little placeholder for find site to support this proposition. You might find that that isn't really what the cases say. Uh, hopefully, you can avoid that yourself. But it's going to happen invariably when someone else is writing a brief and they give it to you and say, "Find the case law that supports this." That and I really someone's going to do that to I you. Mean, it, it's terrible. And it and it happens frequently. You know, it's just that's that's the role that you generally tend to play as a younger attorney. And you know, there's nothing you can do about it other than to note in the back of your mind you're in the position writing a brief like Dave is saying know the law before you start yeah. because if you're, you can't make the law right so yeah invariably at some point in your career someone's going to do that to you find the find the fact find the testimony that supports us or find the law that supports us and it's just it's not going to exist and you're going to tear your hair out other people do it to you don't do it to yourself you, know, you can avoid putting yourself in that situation uh, the other thing uh, to keep in mind when you're getting ready to write a brief is knowing what your goal is. Uh, it is different than uh, writing for your professors in law school on your exams. Uh, it's different than uh, writing a journal article. Uh, it's different than when you're writing a memo uh, to another attorney at your firm on an issue. Your one and only goal in writing a brief is to persuade the court to rule in your client's favor. That's it. That's what you want to do. And keep that in mind. So don't need to demonstrate that you know everything there is to know about contract law. All you have to show is these are the facts, this is the law that applies to them, and here's why you should rule in our client's favor. Uh, so you know, keep, keep in mind that th this is different than a lot of the experience that you get writing while you're in law school. And relatedly, the, the final point we have on your writing plan is uh, you also need to so you're obviously writing for a court as opposed to writing for a partner as opposed to writing you know, for a law review. Um, and that's, that's important to keep in mind because uh, the judge, uh, judges generally don't have a lot of time, right? If you're, 
like an appellate judge has six cases that they're responsible for per week. Um, each brief averages you know about 30 pages, and then there's a reply brief that's usually about 10 pages. So you're talking 70 pages of briefs per case on average times six. It's a lot of material that they're responsible for each week. So you need to keep that in mind and note that, you know, as we'll talk about here a little bit later in the presentation, it's really important for you to be concise with your arguments and with the words you use to make those arguments because judges just don't have a lot of time to read a 50 page brief on an issue that, in a, a case that really can be summed up in 10 to 15 pages. And the judges appreciate that. If you can, Clearly and concisely, uh, it's it'll it'll go a long way towards making your argument more persuasive because you've stripped down some of the extraneous, um, you know, garbage out of your brief that you don't necessarily need. Uh, the other important thing to note about knowing your audience is that it's going to change throughout the case. If you have one judge that's assigned to you uh, to to your case, and there's it, it differs depending on what jurisdiction you're in here in Minnesota. They're gonna, they're gonna be more familiar with the facts you know, as the deeper you get in. So if you're writing or opposing a motion to dismiss, um, that's generally the first time you'll be before a judge. And that's, that would be the time where you really need to spend a lot of, a lot of time and energy developing the facts because this is their first impression. But even if you're, if you're writing a reply brief you know, a few weeks later, your audience has changed in the sense that now the judge has read Two, two motions or two memoranda on the issue. And one of the, one of the things that I've found to be really effective, and Dave can jump in here as well, um, if you're writing a reply brief, you know, boil it down, maybe even in bullet points, to the four or five salient facts that, un, that are underpinning your motion. Because at that point, the judge will have read everything, you get the final say. So your audience has changed again, and your final say is just, hey, look, it's not that complicated. There's really just four or five issues, four or five facts, and I lay them out in bullet points, and then I and then I make my reply. But so that's so each of, each of those three items: knowing your law and your facts, knowing your goal, and appreciating that the audience shifts throughout a case, uh, are really important before you even begin to write. One other point that I would add on knowing your audience is. Find out about the judge. Uh, if you're working in a firm, uh, odds are that someone else in the firm has appeared before this judge, went to law school with the judge, knows something about the way that he or she thinks about a case. Because I, I can tell you from experience, uh, the judge will dictate, to a certain extent, how you write your brief and how you focus it. Uh, if I'm writing for a judge that I know is very intellectual and driven by the law, I'm going to focus on the law and why the law says we should rule that way. There's other judges that are going to tend to be more focused on the facts and reaching the just result. Uh, so then I'm going to emphasize the facts and, and tell the story in a way that makes it clear that my client was the one who was wrong and, and deserves to have uh, a ruling in their favor. So know your audience in the sense of literally knowing your judge. Is your practice structured in a way that you So, I mean, especially in federal court. So all of your magistrates and federal court judges have on their website, um, they're kind of like practice pointers, uh, which are really <laughs> instructions <laughs> that you are expected to follow in terms of, um, you know, how many copies of everything they want, whether they want the copies two-hole punched or three-hole punched. I mean, it's very specific, and you are expected to, to know that going in. Um, I don't think it's as, as much the case in state court. No, I, I don't. I don't think the uh, the state court judges tend to be as particular about uh, how they want things. I, I kind of smirk when you, you're telling this because there are local rules uh, for the district court that dictate 
uh, the number of copies and format and everything else, and it's supposed to be uniform, but then each and every judge has their own kind of set of rules for how they actually want it, and as a, that often are directly contrary to oh, yeah. what the local rules say. Uh, but you do need to be mindful of that and make sure that you're following uh, best practices. Uh, and to your point, it, it does vary too, as you go from the, the district court to appellate courts. Uh, and with my practice, we tend to, it's our case. Uh, we don't have a, a dedicated appellate practice at our firm. Uh, so if something goes on appeal, we're going red one on it and, and we will adjust uh, our plan accordingly. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit now about the, the actual format of a brief. Uh, and there are really uh, probably four key parts of the brief. There's the introduction, there's the facts or background, uh, there is the analysis or argument, and then you end up obviously with the conclusion. Uh, and we're going to discuss each of those uh, and kind of how they fit together and what are key things you need to think about with each of them. Uh, so we'll start out with the introduction. Uh, and although it's the first part of the brief, and it's the first thing I'm talking about, it is always, always, always the last thing I write when I write a brief. Uh, the purpose of the introduction uh, is not to give a summary of your entire brief or a summary of your argument. Uh, the purpose of the introduction is to capture the reader's interest. I always think of my intro uh, like the first two or three paragraphs of a magazine or newspaper article. Because uh, I'll tell you, when I pick up an article and I read the headline, it looks like it might be interesting. If I'm not engaged after the second paragraph, I turn the page and move on to something else. Uh, it's a little bit different with brief writing. I mean, the judges need to read the briefs. They don't have a choice one way or the other. They have to read it. But they're, I would much rather have a judge read my brief and be interested in it than a judge reading my brief and finding it patently boring and difficult to get through and wondering where it's going. All right, so with the introduction, uh, you do want to highlight and, and kind of foreshadow what the case is about. Uh, you want to get right into it uh, with, uh, it's hard to describe how to write these things. Um, you want it to be short, you want it to be concise, and the term that we always use in our practice is we, we want it punchy. Uh, we want to make sure that it's active and that it, it engages the reader. So what you don't do is you don't start out your introduction by saying, plaintiffs bring this motion to compel so that they can acquire the documents necessary in order to pursue their case through litigation. That, that's terrible. You know, if you write it like that, the judge's brain is going to turn off and they're not going to be interested. You want to tell them who your client is, why the other side did something wrong, and then explain why, briefly, the court needs to rule in your favor in this brief. And if your introduction is, I aim for one to two paragraphs, if it's more than three paragraphs, it's entirely too long. It, it, it's really there just to set the stage and pull the reader in and get them interested uh, in what you're gonna say throughout the rest of the brief. Uh, you don't need to highlight every single argument that you're gonna make. You, you might wanna touch on them. Uh, you know, if you, if you have four different arguments for why the court should rule in your favor, Maybe highlight the two most important ones uh, in the introduction, but you're not there to give a, it's not an executive summary uh, of your brief. What do you think about getting into the law in your intro? I, I'm thinking through, I don't know that I do it that much. I, I, I avoid it as well, and it's, it's something that kind of drives me crazy when I'm reading briefs. Right. You know, because it, it's not your argument section, you don't need to list your main authorities that are going to make the case for you, right? So uh, unless it's like one seminal case or one seminal doctrine. Right. Um, yeah, unless your brief is about a dispute over how you, each party interprets one specific case, and that determines everything that falls from that point is, is how that case is interpreted, in which case you're probably writing an appellate brief. That's not going to be a district court brief. I don't discuss the law, and... I, when I discuss the facts in the intro, I discuss them in a very persuasive manner where I'm advocating for my client. I, I never, 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 never include anything neutral uh, in my introduction, uh, or that would tend to cut against my, my interest. The intro is there to convince the reader, A, that this is going to be an interesting issue, and B, that they should rule in my favor. Uh, 
Moving on to the facts, the, the same rule applies in terms of the law. The law does not belong in your facts section. Do not make arguments in your facts section. Uh, you can still be persuasive in the way that you present your facts, but don't discuss the law. Uh, it, it doesn't belong there. It turns, turns me off. It, and uh, one key reason, uh, at least in state court, set up this way. In state court in Minnesota, you have a page limit of 30, 25, let's say it's 25 pages for a brief. But if you're writing a motion for summary judgment, that page limit excludes a discussion of the disputed facts. So you get extra pages on your brief to, do, to include the, the uh, discussion of the facts. Now, if you are arguing the law in your facts section, Find the other side and get your note because you're adding on to your brief and your argument outside of what you're allowed to do in the rules. And basically, you're trying to circumvent the rules to get more pages in there. Um, but also, the, I think you can speak to it probably more from your experience. I don't think judges appreciate it either. I mean, the facts are really there to inform them of what the factual situation is. The next part of the brief is the analysis where you get to make the legal arguments. Yeah, there's a question about that. I think that's probably the most difficult. Trying to write a, a persuasive fact section because you, you can't skew the facts, right? The, uh, the way uh, it was described to me is that you know you look at the facts. There are facts that are support of the, the plaintiff, and then facts that maybe the, are support of the uh, defendant or the respondent. And then there are the, the facts that you describe as kind of neutral facts. You're not really picking and choosing, right, when you're writing your fact section on whichever side you is that right? Or, I mean, I guess it's, it's something that I think. Is, like you said, it's hard to describe, but can you go into a little bit more detail about how? Yeah, and, and I'll use an example of uh, a case that I was involved in. Uh, it was uh, a case between two lenders. 